over at your neighbor say, neighbor, you look 12 pounds lighter today than you did last Sunday. Come on, praise God for that. Amen. Compliments are free in this house. Encourage one another in the Lord. I want you to go to 2 Samuel chapter 3. Verse number one. Dethra. Dethra. Come here. Come here, Devin, come here. I want to bless you before you leave. This young lady has been a part of our church family for at least 10 years. She was a part, she's always been a part of our close and intermediate family. Um, she was on our team as our HR director for a number of years, and she has accepted a job in Texas to work with our friend evangelist Todd White and his ministry. And I don't like anyone to go to the next place and assignment without releasing them in the blessing of the Lord. So what I'd like for you to do is to look is to lift your hands toward her and let us confer. Chris, bring me the oil, please. Confer the blessing of the Lord on her before she leaves today. I don't want you just to feel like you're leaving. I want you to feel like you're sent because you're loved and we thank God for you, your investment into our lives and into this house. And I pray now as a daughter of this house that as you go to this assignment in the kingdom, the favor of our God will rest upon you. And I truly believe that God is getting to do, ready to do something significant in your life in this next city. God said it's not a city, it's, a, it's the next season. Uh huh. And in this next season, there are things coming you've been praying for. Uh huh. And I thank you, Lord, that everything she's been praying for you put a big yes on it right now God said you've been asking according to my will and I heard you and God's getting ready to release some stuff into your life Lord I thank you because she said yes to you a long time ago you have said yes to her desires Father I lay my hands on her now and I bless her I release her in the blessing of the Lord I declare as she leaves, she leaves with the blessing and the affirmation of heaven on her life. Father, her steps are ordered. And now, God, we shake the dust off of a previous season. And we get ready to step into a new city and a new season under a grace we've never known before. I thank you, Father God, for the nations and the places that you will send her in this assignment. I thank you that angels now go with her. She'll never live another day, God, not not walking in the protection and the peace of Almighty God. Favor is on your life, young lady. Devin and I release the anointing and the favor of God over you now, and we declare and decree as you leave, you leave with the blessing of this house and the sealing of the Holy Ghost in your life. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I love you, sweetheart. I'm proud of you. Come on, tell this young lady you love her. If you don't know her, tell her you love her anyway because she's really, really something special and God's hand is on her life. And we honor her and we bless her. I'm going to tell you right now, if you can't leave a church like that, don't leave the church. If, if you leave mad, you're not going to the next season blessed. Oh, I'm making enemies right now, but since you're mad at me, let me fix it real quick. You can't leave bitter and mad and be blessed in the next season. You got to leave in the blessing of the Lord. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for, for what God is doing. And, and God has blessed Dethra and the best is still yet to come. And you'll always be family in this house. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 3. Just for a few moments this morning. I want to take a passage of scripture from 2 Samuel chapter 3 and preach on a thought that God deposited in my heart. 2 Samuel chapter 3, when you got it, say amen. amen. Verse 1. Today my subject is house wars. Look at somebody and say house wars. House 
wars. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul, say Saul, and between the house of David, say David. But the house of David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. The house of David grew stronger and stronger, but the house of Saul got weaker and weaker. House wars. There's a war going on over houses. There's a war going on over your house. Come on, your, your temple. How many know you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? There's a war not only going on over this individual temple, there's a war going on on your family house. Wherever your address is, there's a war going on over your house. And then there are wars going on over houses of worship. What kind of house are you gonna live in? What kind of house are you going to go to? What kind of house are you going to be? Are you gonna be like the house of Saul? Or are you going to be like the house of David? There's a war going on over houses. And I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. Can anybody testify to that today as for me and my house? Come on, get in this anointing with me. Let's preach together. Father, we thank you for what you've said and done already. Thankful for the powerful worship that has been lifted and extended toward heaven. As we have sown praise into the heavens, you have rained down righteousness on your people today and we'll never be the same already. But God, there's nothing like hearing the voice of the Lord. There's nothing like hearing your voice speak to us today. So we ask in the name of Jesus that the anointing that breaks every yoke would come now. Help the preacher preach. You are the preacher, Holy Spirit. And I pray that hearts and minds would be gathered together and that we would sit together in heavenly places at the table of the Lord, receiving the bread of life, which is the word of God. We praise you in advance for what you're going to say and what you're going to start as you say it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Somebody say house wars. Several years ago, Devin and I, um, give me some more right here, Josh, please. Several years ago, Devin and I, um, we sold our house and in Utawa and we knew God was shifting us and aligning us uh, more closely to the heart of the city and through a season of miracles that I will not go into today. God just showed us exactly where to go and exactly what he wanted us to do. And so we went about trying our best to obey the word of the Lord over our life. And part of that plan for Devin and I in that season was to build a house. Now, we had never built a house before. You must understand, when we got married, we were so poor, we couldn't pay attention. We, we, had to, we, we couldn't find two dimes to rub together in our pockets most of the time. The first Christmas we had, we had an old beat-up Charlie Brown leftover Christmas tree, and we sat on the couch on the first Christmas with no gifts under the tree and decided as we were crying, we would go down the road, and we would go to our mom and dad's house, and we would have Christmas with the family <laughs> because we didn't have much. I remember that. And, and then, then we moved to another little house, and we moved to another little house, and we moved to another little house, and came to Uruwa and moved to another little house. And, and this season of our life, just two years ago, Devin and I were at the place where for the first time in our life we could build a house, and God showed us where he wanted to build a house. And so we went and bought the land, and then we went through the tedious process of developing the kind of house we wanted to live in. Now, you understand up until this time, the houses that we lived in had already been built. The wall the structure and the location of the fixtures and faucets had already been decided. But when you got ready to build a, your own house, it took a little more thought. What we did when we moved into all the old houses is we painted a wall, we put carpet on the floor, we did a little decorating, but you know, we really didn't get to decide much about the house. But when you build your own house, you have to sit down and go through meeting after meeting with architects and people who help you decide things. And, and they sit down and they are a blank slate. And what they want to know is what kind of house do you want to live in? 
And this is where Devin and I thank God for grace because there were several times it took a miracle of grace for us to remain married in the midst of trying to build a house. I wanted walls here. Y'all not saying nothing in here today. I wanted a kitchen like this and I found out that she was the one in the kitchen so she gets to decide what kind of kitchen we're going to have. In fact, I found out not only does she get to decide what kind of kitchen we're going to have, she decided everything about the house because at the end of the day, if mama ain't happy, touch somebody and tell them ain't nobody happy in the house yeah 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 so we were building a house and and I go in to sit down with the builder and the architect and he looks at me and he says what kind of house are you wanting to build well you, you know a house a house he said no 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 do you want a French tutor do you want a do you want a craftsman house do you want and I start listening to all these questions and it occurs to me if I'm gonna ever get a house I got to decide what kind of house it is that I want to live in and when I started thinking about this message today it occurred to me God got to decide what kind of house he wanted to live in God, God got to build the house. Come on in here, somebody. God got to build the house just like he wanted it. And what he did is in Psalm chapter 122, verse 4 and 5. I didn't read this to you, but you can put your finger on it. Go read it later. God got to decide what kind of house it was. He was going to demonstrate uh, his, his, his sovereignty and his full purpose through. And he said in Psalm 122, verse 4 and 5, that there are thrones that are set, watch this, that come through the house of David. God said, I'm going to establish my kingdoms on thrones that are set through the house. Somebody say house house of David. In other words, if you can ever find a house that is David's house, if you can ever find a house like David's house, God said that is the kind of house that I'm going to establish my throne through and for generations and in fact I can prove that through all of time God will reign and rule through the throne and the house of David. Which means this, if your house isn't like David's, the king is not coming to your house. If your house is not like David's, the king is not coming through your house. You do not get, now there's a lot of things you get to decide about your life. You get to decide, uh, you get to decide where you're going to live and who you're going to marry and where you're going to work and what color car you're going to have. But there are some things you don't get to decide. And I want to tell you, you do not get to decide what kind of house God is going to live in. God decided what kind of house he's going to live in for himself. And he said in Psalm 122 verse 4 and 5, I am going to establish Establish my throne through the house of David. And the Bible needs some more monitor. And the Bible said that it was through the house and the lineage of David that kings, uh, that, that kings would be raised up that would eventually bring into the earth Jesus Christ who would then become the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If you want to know where Jesus is coming through, Jesus is coming through the house of David. If your house is not like the house of David, the king is not coming. What we have here in 2 Samuel chapter 3 is a very telling scripture about the place in history that Israel was. There was a war going on between two houses. And in reality, the war of the houses was a war over the throne. Because as long as Saul's house was in power, the throne was occupied by people who did not have the heart of Abba. And they led and they operated in false illegal authority while the nation that they were supposedly leading was defeated on the battlefield and they had no favor of God flowing in their life. There was a, somebody say a long war. Say a long war. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And the Bible says that in the midst of this war, something powerful happened. David's house got stronger and stronger. Saul's house got weaker and weaker. David represents covenant. Saul represents religion. 
David represents, oh, I'm getting ready to say something in here today. There's this idea floating around that you can be your own man and do your own thing and advance your own kingdom, which is exactly what Saul did. But David had a heart after God. And here's what I came to tell you today. If you're going to host the king of glory, you've got to have the right kind of house. You cannot have a house like Saul and have the king of glory living in your house. If you want to have the king of glory living in your house, you've got to build your house like King David built his house. The house of David is the lineage through which the king of glory would come. Psalm 122 verse 4 and 5 said God set thrones in place through the house of David. And if you want the king of glory to come to your house, you got to build a Davidic house. Somebody say a Davidic house. Now I want to preach this sermon today in light of the contrasts between Saul's house and David's house. This is real quick. Uh, this is real quick. But I want to give you three c- contrasts that, are, that, that express and demonstrate the differences in Saul's house. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. There's some people building a house like Saul. God ain't in it. They're still having church. And I'm going to tell you right now, having a good service is not having a move of God. Having a good service and even growing a great church is not even a guarantee that the king of glory, it, y'all better say amen in here or something. I want to tell you today, I don't care who leaves as long as the king of glory comes. That's why we came to church today. Let me give you three contrasts between the house of Saul and the house of David and you have to take inventory in your own life. Because if you build a house like the house of Saul, you will not entertain or host the king. Number one, if you're taking notes, write these three contrasts down. Number one, the house of Saul was a house of pride. The house of David was a house of pardon. Somebody say pardon. Somebody say pride. Saul was a house of pride. When you look at the life of Saul, you see the expression of pride. Pride is the kind of behavior that follows what King Saul did in 1 Samuel chapter 10. The Bible said that Samuel anointed Saul as king. And in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 25, Samuel and Saul, they had a talk on the rooftop of the house. The rooftop discussion centered on a great war that would be coming with the Philistines in the future. Samuel told Saul, He let him know through divine wisdom that he was going to have to wait a period of time uh, as they were in the midst of this threatening battle. He was going to have to wait seven days for Samuel to show up. Saul had to wait seven days on the prophet to show up and they would together go up to the hill of the Lord and find the will of God before they got into a battle with the Philistines. But if you read 1 Samuel chapter 9, you will find that Samuel did not come in seven days and when Samuel did not show up when Saul wanted him to, Saul took matters into his own hands and rushed the purpose of God and said Samuel's not here don't miss this the people are demanding an answer and I've got to give them what they want so I'm not going to wait on Samuel I'm going to go offer sacrifices by myself and I'm going to do it like I think it ought to be done and everybody thought that was the right thing to do. Saul is a leader. Saul has to make a decision. Saul has to make the call. What are we going to do, Saul? We need an answer now. We've been waiting seven days, and you've given us no instruction. The Philistines are surrounding us, and we are in trouble. And Saul, watch, felt the pressure of the people, and he made an arrogant decision. He said, I'm going to move without God giving me a word. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, whatever you do. If your neighbor didn't talk to you, karate chop them. Tell your neighbor, whatever you do, don't move without a word from God. Oh, but pastor, we've got to move. We've got decisions to make and budgets to meet and calendars to plan and things to schedule. Don't we need to hurry this along? I want to tell you, you can make your plans, but the Bible said in Proverbs chapter 3, in all your ways, acknowledge God. Don't ever pull the trigger or make a decision without having a word from the Lord. You may see what's up the road, but the Spirit of God knows what's around the corner. Don't miss it. Saul made a decision to not wait on Samuel. 
And you may say, Pastor, where was Samuel? Why didn't he show up? Why didn't he show up in the seven days he said he was going to show up in? I'll tell you why. God was testing the heart of Saul. And you know what? Sometimes God will test us to see. Oh, God. God will test us to see where our dependability is. Because sometimes we think we know what to do. I'm talking to somebody in here right now. We think we know when to do it. But in all your ways acknowledge God. Do not depend on the arm of the flesh. If you birth it in the flesh, you'll have to sustain it in the flesh. Saul offered sacrifices and was not supposed to. When he comes walking up on the scene, Samuel says, what is going on? This is all in 1 Samuel 9 and 10. What is going on? Saul said, you didn't show up. The people needed an answer. I figured we'd offer sacrifice and make a decision to go to war. Samuel said, you disobeyed the word of the Lord. Just another chapter later, he tells Saul, you go, to, you go and kill Agag and everything among the Amalekites. And what does Saul do? He goes into the camp of the Amalekites and he kills everything except Agag, and the king of Amalekites, and all of the most precious sheep. And when Samuel comes walking back into the camp of Saul, he hears the bleeding of the sheep that he was supposed to slay. And the sheep of Agag and the Amalekites were supposed to have been killed. God said, kill everything in the camp of Amalek. And Saul let the king of Amalek, Agag, live and all of the sheep. And when Samuel came walking back into the camp of Saul, he did not hear hallelujahs. He did not hear praise the Lord's. He did not hear thank you God. He heard bleeding sheep. Sheep that were making noise that were supposed to be dead. And Samuel looked at Saul and said, what is the bleeding of this sheep? Uh, what is this, this noise from animals that is coming out of the camp? Why are they still alive? And look what Saul said. I thought. I would let Agag live. And I thought I would keep the best sheep of Amalek for sacrificing. And Samuel looks at Saul and says, because you have disobeyed the Lord, the, the kingdom is being torn away from you. Why would God, and he, you know the story, Samuel the prophet rips the robe off Saul and there in front of Israel, saw the, the, the entire throne stripped away from Saul. Why? Because God said to Saul, I could not trust you to obey me. This is where the scripture that we quote all the time, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Uh huh. Obedience is better than because Saul comes back and says, I was going to offer these sheep to God as a sacrifice. And God said, I don't want the sacrifice. I want you to do what I tell you to do the way I told you to do it. When, come on, somebody. There's something about obedience that will unlock the goodness of God. But if God can't trust you in the little instruction, he'll take away everything he promised you in your life. Look at somebody say, obey God. Now, here's the point of pride. Don't miss this. I got to hurry. Don't miss this. Saul is confronted in both times. When Saul is confronted about the sin of disobedience, do you know what he says to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 11? He says to Samuel, whatever you do, don't let me walk out before the people without you there. Samuel is the prophet. Saul is the king. The kingdom's been taken away from Saul because of his disobedience. And now Saul is really worried about what he looks like among the people. So he says to Samuel, will you come with me when I stand before the people so that the people don't know? They don't know. I don't want them to know that the kingdom's been taken away from me. Will you come and just make it look like I'm all right? He didn't really want his heart right with God. He just didn't want to lose his influence. Pride. Pride. I'll do what I want when I want to do it, and I don't want to have to accept the consequences for my disobedience. Pride. Ah, but David was not a man of pride. 
No, 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 no. David was a man of pardon. Now, I wish I could tell you today that David didn't sin. I wish I could tell you today that the reason God chose the house of David is because David was a pure, perfect, pristine king who never made a mistake, never screwed up, never got his ducks out of a row. He always made the right decision, always did the righteous thing. But when I search through the scriptures, I am appalled at the sin of a man who the Bible says was a man after God's own heart. How can you be the sweet psalmist of Israel and have a, a woman's husband murdered and then be on top of your roof to looking out over all your kingdom and all of a sudden a, a lady taking a bath catch your eye read your Bible some of you think this is Jerry Springer and Maury Povich this is in your Bible your Bible says that David went out on his rooftop I gotta hurry that's why I'm running fast David went out on his rooftop at a time when he should have been in battle and he was looking at all uh, over all his kingdom God has God had given him and while he's looking and gloating and just thinking about all the goodness of God Bathsheba uh oh is on top of her roof and she is unclothed taking a bath and David we are getting ready to see a chapter of David nobody wants to talk about David is a man with a lust problem oh I'm getting ready to preach in here I know you want to talk about King David but King David had a lust problem you want to know how bad his problem was when David was dying and he was on his in his last days and his body was getting cold they threw a virgin in the bed with him and when he didn't have intimacy with her they said the king is dead I didn't say that. Read your Bible. They, 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 he didn't even have any relation. Why? Because they knew he was dying. As long as he was alive, he was always struggling. After a woman, after a woman, I know y'all don't want to hear this. This king is not perfect. He was a murderer. He was an adulterer. He, he robbed other men of their wives. He had, he had women and children. And oh my God, it was a, it was a, it was a Oprah Winfrey session. I mean, this was Dr. Phil stuff. This is, this is bad. We, we got problems. And it just perpetuated through the family because Solomon and Absalom and everything that went on, it was all tore up. And it was because David had issues in his life. You don't want me to talk about that. You don't want me to talk about King David who censored and numbered the people. When God told him, that, see, and here's the problem. God didn't have a problem with him, with him knowing how many were there. It wasn't, that, it wasn't counting people that really frustrated God. It was that David counted on people. But I don't have time to talk about that either. Here's the thing. The issue is David and Saul are both men of sin. Y'all can't handle this, can you? Y'all can't handle, you can't reconcile this. But I want to tell you, there is one reason why Jesus decided to come through the house of David and not Saul. It's not because both of them were perfect, because both of them were flawed. But the house of Saul was one of pride. When Saul fell down, Saul re refused to get his heart right. Saul only wanted an optic. He wanted an optic of repentance. He wanted to look like nothing was wrong. But when David screwed up and David sinned, David got down in the middle of a puddle of tears and said in Psalm 50, one create in me a clean heart oh God and renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from thy presence take not thy Holy Spirit from me there is a reason why if this, you better you better go to a church that is a house of pardon because if you go to a house of Saul they'll look for you to fall and when you fall they got a committee ready to finish you off and they'll throw you off the side of a cliff God, I'm not going to help nobody today you act an awful Presbyterian but I'm talking to somebody in here I want to tell you today you better go to a house of David because in the house of David everybody who's fallen can get back up again I don't care how low you fell down I don't care how big your mess was if you confess your sin he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness as far as the east is from the west that's how far he removed my transgression I want this to be a house of pardon you say I don't go here well just sit here and listen to this for a minute then Everybody in this house, we're going to be a house of pardon. We do not finish off people who fall down. The problem with the saints is we finish off our own. We're the ones that we circle the wagons and throw the final stone that destroys our own brother and sister. And many times the people who do the accusing have their own skeletons in the closet that nobody has found out about yet. God give us a spirit to cover brothers and sisters. I'm not talking about sweeping sin under the rug. I'm talking about restoring brothers and sisters in the spirit of meekness considering yourself
yourself lest you also be tempted. You might, let, oh. I see some sanctified people looking righteously at me right now, but you might need some forgiveness in the future. You might need some mercy by lunchtime today. And you better make sure you're sowing mercy if you go ever need mercy. Oh, I'm not getting no help, but I came to get all up in your business this morning. I'm going to be just like Noxema. I'm coming up under the foundation. I'm going to get right up in your business today. If you want mercy, you got to be a man or a woman of mercy. sick and tired of this religious thing floating around. People are waiting. You know what people are waiting on? You know why they're waiting on people to fall? Because they want their seat. I said it. I said it. They want their seat. And all they're waiting on them to do is fall so that they can move up the ladder. I'm going to tell you right now, God's gifts and callings are without repentance. And if you've got to have your brother or sister have a train wreck to get to your seat, you are illegal in the kingdom of God. I want to be a house of mercy. I want to be a house of pardon. Look at somebody, tell them, pardon me. (laughs) Pardon me. I got some issues I'm working through. Pardon me. Come on, somebody. I got some stuff I'm working through. Don't sit out there and look at me all sanctified and holy. Well, Brother Wallace, I don't cuss and I don't chew and I don't run with those that do. Well, praise God for you. But your nasty attitude is as offensive to God and your arrogance is that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you still got problems. You may not struggle with what your neighbor's struggling with, but if you trust in your own righteousness, you still need salvation. God wants to help those who are of a broken and contrite spirit. I want to be a house of David because I need mercy. Yeah. People sitting up here squirming a little bit. He making me nervous. I want to be like that man who beat on his chest on the corner of the street. Jesus asked a question. There were two men. One was a rank sinner. One was a Pharisee. The Pharisee stood on the corner of the street. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. I haven't gone there. I haven't gone there. And then there was another man who said, I'm a mess. I'm a wreck. My family's all messed up. My past is all full of mess. I don't know what I'm going to do. Help me, God. And Jesus said, who do you think went home justified? It wasn't Brother Sanctified got it going on, Sister Yay Yay, with no problems in her past. It was the man that beat on his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Oh my God, I feel like preaching in here today. Somebody holler, have mercy on me, God. Somebody holler, have mercy on me, God. The house of Saul is one of pride. Arrogant. Won't, oh Lord, don't let me get started on it. People that don't ever say I'm sorry. I asked a man one time, why haven't you told her you were sorry? He said, because I ain't ever done anything wrong. Not only are you not able to apologize, you a dummy. (laughs) Some of y'all got screwed up marriages today because you don't know how to humble yourself. I'm not going to get no help, but I'm going to preach truth anyway. You ain't said I'm sorry in 30 years and you really think you all right? You got a problem. Look at somebody tell them, pardon me. Pardon me. Don't let me get in your way of going to heaven. I got issues I'm working through. Pardon me. Don't, don't let me step on your toes. And don't, I told you a long time ago, in this house, this is a high grace house. We, we've, we've seen some people leave who can't, see, who, who can't see through the eyes of mercy because they see people come in and they're struggling. And they see people come in a drug addict for three or four months and they come to the altar crying. Pastor Gary prays with them every week. All of our pastors and elders pray with them. And people say, well, if they're really saved, if they're really saved, they would have really got delivered. Shut up and sit down. You don't even know what you're talking about. Oh, my God. Some of us have to pray through. And we got to shake generational curses off. And we got to break some stuff off of them. Why don't you just sit down for a minute and let us who are anointed to heal the broken heart do what God called us to do. 
Sit down. Let me go to no, point number two. Oh, Jesus. Say, I want to be in the house of David. There's a war going on over what kind of house you're going to be. And the king's not coming to the house of Saul. King's coming through the house and to the house of David. First point in the first contrast is Saul is a house of pride, David is a house of pardon. The second point is this. Saul is a house of performance. David is a house of presence. Lord, I'm getting ready to say a thing. Saul is all about the optics. Saul was a master of performance. He only wanted the Ark of the Covenant when he was going into battle. He wanted it like a good luck charm. I don't want your glory. I just don't want to lose the battle. So bring the Ark to the field so that we can fight and win. Performance. I'm just about sick of performance. It's all about how shiny we can package and how cute and cool we can market it. It's all about the optics. And God says, you know what? Sometimes I'm not interested in you looking so good. Well, you know, brother, I don't know about it. Look at the birth of Jesus, y'all. I mean, if I were the king, I'd have been like, Ritz. Penthouse at the Ritz. Come on, y'all, don't lie. We the king here. Or derb. Come on, bring it all. I'm the king. I'm showing up. Not the king of glory. No, 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 no. No, no. He ain't not about performance. He said, just let me have the animal shed. with the stinky dung of the animals. There's no room in the hotel. But I didn't come for those who wanted the glitz and the glamour and the performance. I came for the lowly and the meek and the humble. This, this thing about performance, it's... Okay, okay. So since we're here talking about Campus Choir today, and I got so choked up yesterday when you showed the video from Dr. Horton. Because I never had anybody until that man came into my life who taught me what worship was. And he used to say this all the time, Pastor Jim, and I didn't understand it. I'm like, surely he don't mean that. He would say things like, I'd rather have a dedicated, faithful quartet than a choir full of singers who are not committed to God. And I would say, he don't mean that. We go out there as a quartet, we're going to get run off the stage. But I watched him many times. Tell people, you, you, you're not ready to sing yet. You need to get some stuff right in your heart. Y'all can't handle this, can you? Well, I want to be seen. That's the problem. Go die. And y'all don't know whether to clap or run. I don't know. It's performance. It's a mentality. It's standing up and thinking you have all the answers and you can depend on your gift and on your range and on your scale and on your intellect and your study and you, you're all educated and that's all wonderful. Your range and it's beautiful and everything about you is wonderful and grandiose but at the end of the day if it hadn't died to self and come alive in the power of God you have nothing by which you can help humanity because at the end of the day your gift will not break the yoke. Your education Education will not break the yoke. What you know will not break the yoke. The yoke shall be all kandabashe. The yoke shall only be destroyed because of the anointing. Get all the education you can. Get all the planning that you can. Get as good as you can be. But at the end of the day, reach your trembling hand up to God and say, I can't do this by myself. Somebody holler and tell them, I can't do this by myself Saul was a house of performance if you build a house on performance the king can't show up oh, oh I've sung and I've preached in places I pray, oh God I've preached in places oh Jesus 
I preached in places and they were impressed with their own performance. And you could see it. It was polished. It was grand. It was planned. And, pro and I got nothing wrong with preparation. God never put a premium on unprepared people. Well, we're going to come and show up on Sunday and see what the Lord says. No, 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 no. You better go pray and get a plan together. Come on, somebody. Don't walk up here on this stage and find out what you're going to preach when you walk to the pulpit. Can you imagine what kind of train wreck this would be if every Sunday I pranced to the pulpit and said, hold on, I'm waiting, y'all. No, you got to pray and you got to plan and you got, but, but, the, but the difference is this. Are you dedicated to your performance or are you dedicated to his presence? And when he shows up and does something different than what you planned, are you willing and obedient to get in the river and let the Holy Ghost navigate you? I'm not finding no help in here today. Have a plan, but be addicted to the presence of God. There are some Sundays when we come in here and I got a plan and we all got a plan and we got that little service planning pro, whatever it is, whatever to call. We all, we all on service pro and we're looking at what's next and what's next and we know what it is. But sometimes something not on the performance plan invades the house and we got to say, hold on a minute. Devin, look over there and say, I feel the Lord. I feel the Lord. I'm like, that ain't on the plan. Yeah, 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 but I feel the Lord. And the Lord is saying somebody needs to shift. And the Lord is saying somebody needs to break through. What are you saying? I'm saying, what do you want? Your performance? Or do you want the pro? God, do you want the presence of the Lord? Why do you always got to holler? Listen, I don't have to. I tell myself every Sunday, talk. Shut up, chill out, and talk. But this thing is down in my bones. This thing about the glory of the Lord, I have to contend for it. I cannot be silent about it. I refuse to let a generation go through motions. We need the glory and the probable shot of my eye. Saul was a house of performance. Don't miss this. God took his throne away and he still stayed the king for 15 years. Literally, the Holy Spirit lifted off of Saul and he still remained king for 15 years, which tells me something. People learn how to do kingdom things without the Holy Ghost. I didn't get no help on that right there. There are people who know how to be king without the Holy Ghost. They know how to do the, the church thing without the presence of the Lord. I'm, I, listen, I have nothing wrong with having a, a, a great plan, but there's a difference between the house of Saul and the house of David. The house of Saul is all about performance, but when David became king, something shifted in the atmosphere. David said, where is the Ark of the Covenant? I'm not in battle, I'm not in a war, but I want the presence of God. It's not even that I have to have it. It's that I want it, my God. I want to tell somebody in this room today, you better make up your mind if you're going to be all about performance or if you're going to be presence driven. Because if you know, if you know the presence of God, he'll make you look better than you really are anyway. Amen. Who's a witness? Amen. Have you ever had the Holy Ghost make you look smarter than you really were? Today for me, <laughs> yesterday, come on. Have you ever had the Holy Ghost make you look more genius than you really are? And you start talking and people say, where did that come from? And you say, God, they're impressed with what you told me in prayer yesterday. And they think you got it, but what they don't know is that you know who gave it to you. It was the presence of God. Oh, I'm a shake it, Ibohosa. I feel like making myself happy in the Lord right now. I want to tell you that the Holy Ghost will make you look smarter than you are. He'll make you sing better than you sing. He'll make you preach better than you preach. If you lean on him, he'll send his presence. And his presence will make the difference. You'll be a better preacher with the presence of God. The house of Saul is all about performance. The house of David is all about presence. Stop living for the optics and the approval of man. I can't lead without his presence. I can't sing without his presence. 
I can't preach without his presence. I can't parent without his presence. I can't write my bills without his presence. Shoot, I can't even go to Walmart without his presence. How many need him? How many need God? Let me ask you a deeper question. How many want God? Yeah, need is a matter of necessity. Want is a matter of desire. Do you just have to have him to make it? Or do you wake up every morning and say, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. I don't want to live today without your glory. I don't want to do anything today without your presence in my life. Oh, Wallace, you're too spiritual. Says the backslider. Says the one that was hot 20 years ago and now you've just cooled off a little bit. If you can look back over your life and there was a season in your life when you were hotter for God than you are right now, you better get rid of that performance mentality and fall back in love with Jesus all over again. Saul, are our musicians here, drummer here? So, did someone help me? I'm going to quit in just a minute. Oh, Jesus. The last one, the first one is that Saul was a house of pride. David was a house of pardon. Second one, Saul was a house of performance. David is a house of presence. He went and got the ark. He brought the ark of the covenant. Now, I know, and we criticize David. Oh, David got us killed. Now listen, David, David had to get some order and he had to get some revelation. But I'm tired of people criticizing David because he just wanted the presence. Uh, it's not time for that one. It's a happy key. You leave. We'll, we'll do that in a minute. It's okay. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just making sure he knows where I'm going. I'm getting ready to preach my head off. I'm not landing it yet. I'm getting ready to go one level higher. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. We just have to talk it through. We've never done this before. It's all right. David got the presence back into the camp. I know Uzzah died and the, house, and the glory was parked at the house of Obadidim for 90 days. But during those 90 days that the glory was at the house of Obadidim, David went back and got, got a copy of the law. He went back into the Old Testament and he started reading about how to properly carry the presence of the Lord. And he found out you don't carry the presence of the Lord on, big, on boards and big wheels. He said, he said, no, 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 it's not carts. It's not boards and big wheels that carry the presence. He said, it's dedicated, consecrated, righteous men and women, priests of the Lord that bear up under their shoulders the weight of the glory of God. Oh my God, I feel him in here. And it's not just a thing that the priests carry, but it's a thing of sacrifice. Every six steps they took, they set it down and offered a sacrifice. They took another six steps and set it down and they offered a sacrifice. And they looked back over the trail which they carried the presence and blood was everywhere because if you're going to go into the glory you got to come in through the blood of the lamb and the lamb of God is Jesus Christ hallelujah David was all about the presence of the Lord and now the house ooh, and now the presence of the Lord the ark of God had been in Obadidim's house for 90 days but watch this the last point is this the house of Saul was a, was a house of position the house of David was a house of praise oh, I'm getting ready to preach right here I'm getting ready to preach right here because Saul was all about the position how do I know that? Because when David went to the battlefield to bring cheese and bread to his brothers who were in battle with the Philistines, David is a little shepherd boy. All he knows is how to take care of sheep. And in his job as taking care of sheep, a few weeks ago, a lion jumped out and he tore the lion asunder. A few days later, a bear jumped out and he tore the bear apart. And now he comes down to the field to take care of his brothers. He's not even old enough to fight in the field of battle, but the Bible said that he brought cheese. Read the Bible. He brought cheese and bread and some and some nourishment to his brothers. And when they got when he got down there to bring them the food, the Bible said that he heard Goliath talking smack. Anybody here play basketball? 
Oh, come on, Antonio. Come on, Deacon Farmer. When you get these guys on the basketball court, they, 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 they look old and they, and they run old. And, and, but you let them get warmed up a little bit and they start talking smack with each other. Oh, and it's something, it's something worth seeing. I mean, they, oh, come on in here, somebody. They just start talking trash. And, oh, you're horrible. Your mama, your daddy, your greasy-eyed granny. It's just bad. And that's what's going on in 2 Samuel. There's a battle going on and Goliath is talking smack and he's defying the God of Israel and all these Israelites are listening to this uncircumcised giant talk smack about their God and David is just the little waiter. All he did was come and bring some cheese and bread for his brothers and he hears this giant talking smack. Don't miss this. And the Bible said he stopped with the waiter job and all of a sudden got ticked off and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the God of Israel? Don't miss this, don't miss this, don't miss this. They looked at him and said, would you please chill out and sit down, David? You're just a little too excited. You're trying to make a name for yourself. Don't miss this. Saul, he went to the camp and the tent of Saul. And Saul, say position. Come on, say position. Saul is all about position. Why? Because when David said, I'm going to go out and fight Goliath, what did Saul say? Saul said, here's my armor. Now, you read that all your life in Sunday school and thought, oh, look at Saul. He being so nice to David. Oh, no. Saul was trying to put the armor on David that belonged to the king so that when the boy killed the giant, everybody would look at the armor and not be able to see the boy. They'd see the armor, and they said, King Saul killed David. He wanted Israel to think he killed the giant. The problem is, he's a chicken. He was all about the position. I got to show everybody, I'm the king. David, put on my armor. Make yourself look like me so that when you do what I can't do, people will think I'm the one that gave them victory. Position. David said, hold on a minute. I have never tried this mess out. In fact, I can't even hardly move in your nasty armor. But a few days ago, a lion jumped out of the bushes and I ripped him asunder. And a few days later, a bear came out and I took care of him. And this uncircumcised Philistine is no match for me because he comes to me with a spear and a sword. But I come to this giant in the name. Oh, somebody better wind it up today. Hallelujah! Some people saw this situation as a giant who was going to kill David. Some people look at this situation and they say, David, you can't kill him. He's too big for you. David looked at the giant and said, he's too big to miss. I'm getting ready to storm him with the word of the Lord. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, neighbor, the devil can't be missed. You're going to hit him right between the eyes. If God be for you, who can be? Saul was all about position. David is all about praise. I cannot find one place in the Bible where Saul danced himself out of his robe. Oh, no. Oh, no, you can't find, you can't say hello to our sons and daughters who are going to work in the kids' department. This is RSM. Tell them you love them as they go. Come on. I'm closing. I'm closing. If you want to know what RSM is, that's our school of ministry. Amen. Never mind. David, David is now leading people in a processional in Israel. And the glory of God is coming back in the city. And what does David do? He forgets his position. Have you ever forgotten who you were? Come on in here. Have you ever gotten in such a place of God's presence being poured out? You forgot you had a reputation and an ego to protect. Oh, y'all not even hear what I'm telling you. Have you ever forgot about who was sitting next to you? Have you ever forgotten that you were somebody important sitting in a place with a bunch of important people? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. J.D. and Anzi Woodside will tell you, and anybody else inquired with me back in the day, we would go into these big cathedrals, and the glory would just hit, and we'd go running, and all these people, 
I'll never forget being at Lee Day, 1998, and the glory of the Lord fell when you were singing, There is a Fountain. The glory of the Lord fell, and we're sitting, I'm telling you, the glory fell, and the power of God's being poured out, and they were trying to get us off the stage, and they said, Thank you, Campus Choir. And Dr. Horton said, Uh oh, oh, no, 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 not today. We're getting ready to take this thing to another level. And he said, One more time. And when he hit that thing one more time, J.D. Woodside did a worm across the front of the stage. A hundred young men took off running. Preachers got breakthrough. Singers got breakthrough. Leaders got a breakthrough. Because there's power. Oh, yes, there's power in your praise. I wish I could find 300 people who would find them a praise and give God, oh Lord. Somebody give God your best praise. Take 15 seconds and give God your best praise. Praise ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord. Praise God in a sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him on the symbol. Praise him on the high sounding symbol. Praise him on the stringed instruments. In fact, let everything, oh Lord, let everything, somebody help me in here, praise God. Let everything that has breath, rise. On Monday, all about shame. I gotta go. We got a second service. But I feel like telling somebody this. You gotta keep your garment of praise. Because you're gonna get in some rooms sometimes. And you got on a garment of praise, they're gonna look at you funny. And they looked at David funny. And in fact, his own wife looked at him and said, Well, I guess you feel better. You danced before all them women of Israel. And David said, I don't know. Ooh, I don't know what you're talking about. It was not for the women of Israel that I danced on this day. He said, but when I danced, I danced before the Lord. Somebody got to be reminded that when you praise God, it ain't for the person next to you. My praise ain't about you at all. My praise is all about the one that brought me up. Somebody give God praise. I said somebody give God praise. Praise him until he breaks the chain. Praise him until he brings you out. Praise him until he heals your body. Oh, oh. Yeah. Almost shire. He said, and this is it, I'm through with this. In the Wallace unauthorized translation of the Bible, she looked at him and said, you look so foolish. He said, in the Wallace unauthorized translation, you think that was something? You ain't seen nothing yet. Cause I will be, I will be, I will be even more foolish as I praise the Lord. Oh God, I don't have time. But there are seven words in the Hebrew for praise. I don't want to talk about Yada. I don't want to talk about Tala. I don't want to talk about Tehillah. I don't want to talk about Shabbat. I want to talk about Halal praise. Because when David said, I'm going to praise the Lord, he said, literally, I'm going to spin my way. I'm going to shout my way into the present. Slap your name and say, I ain't dancing for you. Tell them I ain't shouting for you. Tell them I'm shouting under God. Open up your, open up your mouth and shout unto God. Yes, yes. I feel a breakthrough in this house. He must shut that up all time. I feel a breakthrough in this house. Somebody gotta give God praise.
If you want your house to be a house of David, lift your hands right now. Lord, get rid of all of the Saul in us. The pride, the performance, the position. Give us a hunger for the presence of the living God. Now take 30 seconds and give him your praise right now. Just however you praise him. Oh, I don't want my house to be a house of soul. I want my house. To be a house like David. God, I pray for our church today. May we be a house of pardon. We be a house of presence. And may we always be a house of praise. Amen. Look at your neighbor before we leave. Tell your neighbor, put on a garment of praise. Put on a garment of praise. For the spirit of heaviness, lift up your hands to God. Pray in the spirit and with understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. I don't know where that came from. It's been a hundred years since we sang that song. Put on the garment of praise. We got to go. I'm trying to prophesy over you before you leave. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, change your clothes. Come on. You say, well, I don't need to change my clothes. I'm happy. If you are, notify your face. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lift up your voice and hands to God. God. Yeah, right there. Pray in the spirit and with understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. We love you, Lord. Lift your hands up in a receiving position. Lord, bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them. Give them your grace. Give them your peace this week. Give them divine favor, divine appointment, divine protection. Be with them, God, I ask in the name of Jesus. And everybody who loved God said amen. Shake hands with 118 people. Hug their necks. Exit on the side. Second service is coming in in just a moment. God bless you.